What's up YouTube, I'm Guy, and today on the channel I wanted to do a Seiko Saturday video. It's been a long time since I've done one of these, but luckily I have not one, but two Seiko 5 divers on loan from viewers. Big, big, big thanks to both of you guys that have loaned in these watches for review. I do appreciate it very much. What we're looking at is the Seiko 5 SNZ F17, often referred to as the Sea Urchin, and the SNZH55, a very popular Seiko 5 that people typically buy to create a Black Pond 50 Fathoms style mod with. They're both really cool watches and I'm happy to have them here today, so big thanks again to both of those guys that lent these watches in. Now I know what some of you guys are going to say. A couple of weeks ago, didn't you do a video where you said you didn't like Seiko anymore? No, that's, that's not what I said at all. I'm just disappointed in the direction that Seiko has been going. They've discontinued a lot of collectors' favorite watches, watches that we all considered, considered value propositions. They've been replacing them with new models that are more expensive. They've been doing a lot of limited editions. Yeah, I've been a little disappointed with the direction that Seiko has been going, but I did say in that video there's a number of models still in their catalog that I consider value watches. That, that's, that, that list, though, I guess is what I want to say, has been shrinking. There are, though, again, a lot of watches that are value options, and these two certainly fit into that description. There's a lot of Seiko 5 watches that do, as well as the SKX, the Turtle, some of those other Prospex divers are still pretty good value options. I wanted to mention that a lot of you guys, I've noticed, have been coming over to the Horology 101 Facebook group, joining up and joining in the discussion. If anyone out there is not a member of that Facebook group already, again, it's Horology 101. I will put a link down in the description of this video so you can find it easier, come on over and uh, join us in the watch discussion over there. It's a small but growing group and we're having a lot of fun. Alright guys, here we have the Seiko SNZ F17 on the left, often referred to as the Sea Urchin, and the SNZH55 on the right, often used to mod to create a Blanc Pond 50 Fathom style mod. Uh, these two watches have price points. Generally, you can find them for around 150 bucks, maybe even a little bit less than that. Uh, they do have J versions, though. So if you want the J version, which is, I guess, made in Japan, uh, they're usually $25 or $30 more. Now, there's a little bit of debate as to whether or not the J versions are made in Japan or not, or if they're just made overseas somewhere like Malaysia, but the quality control and fit and finish is oversaw by Japanese workers. I've heard a number of different stories. Let's suppose that the J versions are made in Japan. Is it worth spending that extra 25 or 30 bucks on the watches? Personally, in my experience, I don't think so. I've reviewed the SKX009K and the SKX009J, and I, while there were minor differences between them, none of the differences struck me as being uh, to do with where they were made, allegedly. It just is variation in the overall production of, you know, mass-produced products. Things are going to be different from time to time. Lower levels of quality control on affordable products like this. So, yeah, ultimately, no, it's probably not worth the extra money to purchase those J versions. Anyways, I'll move on and say that uh, the specs on these watches, they're very, very similar. Mainly the differences are going to be style or aesthetics. The Watch on the left, the SNZ F17. We'll take a quick look at that one first. Overall, the dimensions on this watch. We have a diameter from one side of the case or the other, not inclusive of the crown or crown guards of 42 millimeters. We have a lug width here of 22 millimeters, an overall thickness of approximately 12 millimeters, and a lug to lug width from one extremity of the case to the other, or what I like to call the watch's wingspan of 49 millimeters. The SNZH, the one on the right here, very similar in size. The overall dimensions on this watch, we have a 42 millimeter case diameter. We have 22 millimeter lug widths. We have a thickness of uh, about 14 millimeters if you include that slightly domed crystal. Uh, so slightly thicker than the other watch. But we have a lug to lug width from one side of the case to the other of about 47 and a half. So about a 
one and a half millimeter size difference smaller in overall lug to lug width. Uh, but yeah, virtually identical in terms of size. One of the big takeaways for me when I discovered that was that if you look at these side by side, at least when I do, if you were to say which one's bigger, with the eyeball test, I would say the one on the right, the SNZ-H55, is the bigger watch. But same case diameter, same lug width, a little bit thicker, but a little bit shorter of an overall lug to lug width. So it's kind of an optical illusion in that it looks bigger, at least to me. Maybe, you, uh, maybe you'll disagree. Let me know in the comments down below which of these two watches appears to have a, uh, you know, a bigger overall size and scale. Again, to me, it's the one on the right. It does look bigger, despite the fact that they're almost identical. The other specs on these watches, also basically the same. 316L stainless steel cases. Both are on a stainless steel bracelet. We have a hard lex crystal, and of course, a display case back. 120 click unidirectional bezels on both watches and 100 meter water resist. Of course, the dial and handsets of these and pretty much every watch that Seiko makes features their excellent LumaBright luminescence material. We have, of course, have a day and date complication over at the three o'clock position on the dial, and that day and date is connected to the 7S36 movement. The 7S36 movement, a variant of the 7S26, is really nothing to write home about. It's a 23 joule automatic movement. Its vibrations or beats per hour is such that it runs at 21,600. We have a roughly 40 hour power reserve and an accuracy range from between minus 20 to plus 40 seconds per day from the factory. Overall, yeah, nothing extremely impressive. And as I had alluded to in a previous video, I talked about this movement. I've had problems with them. I've had probably 20, maybe 25 different watches that use different variations of the 7S series. And not infrequently, I've had timekeeping problems, even outside of that minus 20 to plus 40 second per day accuracy range. It is e easy to regulate these, and I've done a video demonstrating on how to regulate the uh, Seiko movements. The problem is that they don't stay regulated. Over time, they drift back out of spec, basically, and they can be very uh, random in their timekeeping, such that if I put one of these on my time grapher, not all of them, but more often than I like, I'll see results where it'll keep maybe plus 30 seconds for 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds, and then it will swing to plus 60 or plus 70 seconds, and it'll keep that time for a little while. Then it will swing down to, you know, maybe minus 10 seconds. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, uh, disturbances in the timekeeping on some of these watches. Plenty of you guys out there, I'm sure, will chime in and say that you've had this watch, that watch, or the other, and it keeps excellent time. They do. They do. This isn't like something that happens with every watch, but I have seen it more than a few times and, you know, I can't really ignore it anymore. So couple that with the fact that this movement also doesn't have hand winding or hacking, you know, and my somewhat negative experiences with them. Overall, I'm not entirely impressed with this movement. So we have basically the same specs, we have the same movements. What differentiates these two watches from one another, aside from a few millimeters of uh, size? It's pretty much all going to be aesthetics, and my preference of these two is the watch on the left, the SNZF17, often referred to as the Sea Urchin. So we'll take a quicker look at uh, both of them, starting with that one. The case on the SNZF, it's decently done for an entry-level watch. We have high polished edges on the flanks or sides of the case. There's no bevels, there's no real strong detail. The lines differentiating, differentiating between the polished sides and the brush tops aren't very crisply designed. Overall, it's functional though, it's decent. There's uh, no real highlights, but there's not any real lowlights either. The brushing on the tops of the lugs as well as on the bracelet is good. It's kind of a straight grained satin brushed finish. Uh, yeah, overall it's, it's decent. On the right hand side of the case, of course, we have our 
crown guards which protrude out to protect a non-screw down crown. Neither one of these crowns screw down on this watch. Despite that though, we do get uh, 100 meters of water resistance on both of them. I had obviously mentioned we do have a display case back on the back of these watches, so you can see that 7S36 movement in, in there if you'd like to. But yeah, overall, the uh, case on this watch, it's, it's simple, it's unadorned with decoration or embellishment, uh, very utilitarian, but obviously, uh, you know, functional. Nothing to write home about, but really nothing to complain about either. The crown on this watch is a little polished crown, like I said, not screw down. It is a push-pull crown. Since the movement isn't hacking, pulling the crown all the way out does not stop the seconds hand from running. The texturing on the crown is good enough. It's not uh, extremely aggressive, but uh, you can manipulate and operate this crown without any problems at all. The crystal here is a hard lex crystal. There's no AR coating, anything like that. So you can see we get glare. There's my camera. As I pan over towards the lights, we get some, you know, definite glare there. That's to be expected at a watch at this price point. Nothing to really be too concerned with. The bezel on both of these watches are, again, functional, but nothing to write home about. The insert is a matte black aluminum insert with painted graduations, markers, and indices. It's done well enough. The action, like the action of all of these more entry-level Seiko watches, is what I would describe as spongy. The clicks are not super firm, and the bezel is not overly stiff. Uh, it's, it's functional, it works. It's, uh, you know, entry-level. It's basically what you should expect. It's not bad, nor is it absolutely outstanding. There's certainly some back play as you click over, well, this one's actually pretty decent, honestly. We hit that first click, and then just a little tiny bit of backplay. There's the click. Yeah, that, that actually, this one has very uh, minimal backplay, whereas the other watch I'll show you in a minute has a little bit more. Somewhat atypical for a watch at this price point, we do have applied markers on the dial, a nice high-polished stainless steel handset. The day and date complication is surrounded with a metal um, border or surrounding. Overall, the dial is actually really, really nicely done. Applied logo, Seiko 5 up at the top. Printing, sports, water, 100 meter resist, automatic 23 joules down on the bottom side. It's all done really good. This is probably the main event for this watch, the dial. I really do like it. And if someone was looking for a watch that was a bit like a Submariner without being a full-on homage watch, you know, this would be a really good option if you want something in the realm of affordability, which this most certainly is. Next we'll take a look at the SNZ H55, very reminiscent of the Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms, mostly because of the style of the bezel and the geometry of the case. Speaking of the case, the quality of the finishing is pretty much equal to the SNZ F17 that we just looked at, high polished on the flanks, but you can see that the shape is very much different, sort of a kettle or bowl shaped from the lugs coming over into the sides of the case here. Similarly, we have the same style and quality of brushed finishing on the tops of the lugs and of course the bracelet, although some of the center portions of the links on the bracelet are polished. Same sort of situation with the crown on this watch, although I think that the texturing or knurling pattern on the crown is a little more aggressive and a little bit more user-friendly. Uh, you can get a nicer grip on it. That said, neither one of them are threaded screw-down crowns, so they're not hopper they're not difficult to uh, operate anyway. But neither one is a signed crown, as you'll notice. I don't really care that much about signed crowns, though. Not really a big deal for me. The crystal on this watch is a little bit different. Of course, it's hard lex, just like the other. But if we look at it in profile, you can see that there's sort of a chamfer or beveled edge and it domes a little bit. I, I can't really think of many Seiko 5 watches that have this kind of crystal. Off the top of my head, I think this might be the first time I've ever seen such a thing. It's actually a nice little touch, a little style and aesthetic cue above the other watch and probably many watches in the Seiko 5 line. So uh, yeah, that's also kind of cool. The bezel on this watch, also 120 click unidirectional, is a little bit different, not in terms of operation or functionality. I would say it's very similar. Although I did mention, I think that this one has a little bit more back play. When we hit that mark, it kind of has some back play there. So click and then back play, click, and then some back play. So it's a little sloppier. That's just going to be the way it is with Seiko 5 watches. From, from watch to watch, you might get another one of this exact model that is uh, 
got a, a nicer, crisper, more solid bezel than this particular example. That's just the way that the quality control on these watches go. The interesting thing about this particular bezel is as we come in here nice and close, you can see that the the insert, which I assume is a painted aluminum insert, is covered by a piece of glass or crystal, probably hard lex crystal if I had to guess. But you're never going to scratch up the actual bezel insert. Now, I guess you could potentially scratch up that glass. This is very similar to how the Blancpain 50 Fathoms bezel is is assembled as well. It's more domed on the Blancpain, and I've reviewed that watch in the past. But that's why you get a lot of that sense of similarity between this very, very affordable watch and that very, very expensive Blancpain watch. It's because of the way that this bezel, <laughs> bezel, bezel is, uh, is constructed with that sort of glass cap over the aluminum painted insert. Coming in a little bit closer, this dial also has applied markers. These are sort of stick style markers with little highlights of loom towards the center edge of each of those sticks. We have embellished markers at the 12 and 6 and uh, also I guess the 9 position as well. A little difficult to pick up there on the camera the way my lighting works. They're faceted with polished and brushed edges. Uh, it's, it's really actually a very nicely done dial. We also have that applied logo, Seiko 5 at the top, and then printing sports automatic 23 joules, 100 meters at the bottom. At the very bottom of the dial, you'll probably see that it says made in Japan. This is a J version, and they command a little bit of a higher price compared to the K versions. Again, I don't think that it's particularly better one way or the other, but if you wanted to say made in Japan down at the bottom edge of your dial, you can pay for that and get a J version of these watches. Of course, we have that day and date complication at the three o'clock position, and it is also framed in a metal surround. I mean, the, the dial on this watch, just like the other, very well done, and I think they punch above their weight class in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the overall quality that you're getting with these very affordable watches. The handset's nice, high polished stainless steel, sword style hands in this case, with uh, a little bit of a almost, uh, I don't know, lancet type uh, seconds hand, but there's kind of a little arrow point out there towards the end, and uh, yeah, overall it's, it's implemented really well. I'll bring in loom shots of both of these watches side by side. You can see that, of course, the SNZ F17, the watch on the left, it just has more loom. It's not necessarily brighter loom. Lumabrite is always very bright. Uh, but because the markers are bigger, the loomed portions of the markers anyway, you're just going to get that sense of a brighter loomed watch with the sea urchin. And with the SNZ H55, the dial is sort of a little bit more classy, just with the way that those markers are dressed up and decorated or polished, finished, however you'd like to describe that. It's a different feel. So the loom is a little bit more subdued and I think that it's fitting for that watch. A couple of very nice entry-level watches here. Overall, I like them both. I think you're probably not going wrong with either. If you want to get something to play around with, maybe your first automatic watch, maybe your first diver. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the Seiko Saturday review video. As always, down in the description below, you'll find a number of ways that you could help support the channel if you're interested in. First of all, following me on my my social media accounts, be it Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. All the links are down below. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, that would be amazing as well. Big thanks to the guys that have been over on Patreon supporting me. I really do appreciate it. Finally, if there's anything that I review that you want to purchase, I'll always try to include a link to that product down in the description through my Amazon affiliate account. If you want to buy anything like either of these watches or anything else for that matter, I get a small commission and those commissions do add up. A very big thank you to everyone that's been using that Amazon link. I do appreciate it. That's going to wrap this up. Thanks again. And um, until next week, I guess I'll go ahead and say bye now.